Welcome, 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 welcome. Happy Easter! It's resurrection morning or resurrection evening, depending on where you are. Today we are celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the grave. You know, on Friday, Good Friday service, it was all sober and somber moment, you know, and um, hallelujah, though he was killed. We know that he resurrected. So into this service, we're going to do a little bit of teaching, which we normally do on Tuesday, but there's a reason for it. Because if you're a Christian, you need to know. You need to know what Easter is all about. You need to know why is why the force, what is all this force about Easter? You know, um, I'm doing a course on counseling and as a group, like the students, we have a WhatsApp group. So this morning, everybody was sending happy Easter, happy Easter. But there's this guy that openly in the class has made everybody know that he's an atheist. So everybody was saying happy Easter, happy Easter. He just said happy bunny day. <laughs> you know, and I chuckled and I kept quiet, you know. No matter how, you know, the enemy wants to discredit the resurrection of Christ, it is evident all around us. There are even scientific evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. So we're going to look at what happened. Yes, Jesus died. But what happened between the cross and the open tomb? The key word there is open. <laughs> The tomb is not closed. It is open because our Lord Jesus Christ resurrected. And you know all about the Apostles' Creed, you know. If you are a believer, you must have heard about the Apostles' Creed. And what is the Apostles' Creed? You know, the Apostles' Creed is like a statement of belief, you know, by Christians. What we believe in. You know, I'm going to expand this a bit so you can see something. Say, so I believe... In God, the Father, you know, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of a virgin called Mary. What happened? He suffered under Pilate. But that is not entirely correct, if you know what I mean. Yes, Pilate gave the order for him to be beaten, but the suffering actually was perpetrated by the high priest and the religious leaders. You know, very clear. The scripture was very clear on that. I say he was crucified. Jesus was crucified, nailed to the cross. And he did what? He died and was buried and he descended to hell. Now, there's a phrase there, he descended to hell. There is this um, church, whenever they state the Apostles' Creed, they always put an asterisk on that phrase, he descended to hell. They put the asterisk, he descended to hell. And at the bottom of the page where this um, Apostles' Creed was written, they will always write hell, meaning the place of the dead not the place for punishment. And that got my attention. And that's why I want to start today. They say hell, the place of, of the dead, but not the place of punishment. That is entirely false. Okay, let me say it is, it is, it is, it is half truth. Hell is not only the place for the dead. Hell is also the place of punishment. And we need to know that is a place of punishment because it was part of the things that Jesus had to go through for the three days or so to say, two days, two nights or thereabout, he was in the grave. So today we are going to be looking at what happened when Jesus died. Get your pen, get your notepad. This is an exciting study. Believe me. An exciting study is going to radically transform you, change your perspective about Christ, Easter, 
and, the, and his death and resurrection. And he's going to fill your heart with so much revelation that will change your Christian life and propel you to your next level. So what happened when Jesus died? The first thing that happened when Jesus died is that he descended to hell. The Bible was so clear on that. He descended to hell. Now, when you read the scriptures, there are several names for that place called hell. In some places, they call it Sheol. They call it the Abyss. They call it the Pit. They call it Hades. There are several names for that place called hell. But Jesus descended to hell. He did. Now, the Bible says something in Luke chapter 23. And I'm going to read from verse 44. The Bible says, Now, it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. The sixth hour is 12 noon, and there was darkness till like 3 p.m. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn into two. Okay, let me pause here and solve an enigma. And what is the enigma? The Bible says that Jesus died for three days and three nights. But when you do the maths, it appears that he only was in the grave for two days. That's if he died on Friday. That you, so that means he was in the grave for f- Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night. And the Bible says before morning on Sunday, he had resurrected. So, where then? How come? The Bible says he was dead. He was going to die for three days and three nights. Even Jesus himself said it. He said for three days and three nights, just as, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for, fish for three days and three nights, that the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. So, was Jesus lying? No, Jesus was not lying. First, God, and of course, adopted by the Jews, does not count days from from the day, if you know what I mean. When you read Genesis chapter 1, there it was stated in Genesis chapter 1 how God counts and calibrates the days. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, And the evening and the morning was the first day. And the evening and the morning was the second day. So how many days and nights did Jesus spend in the grave? Obviously, when he died on the cross, when he died on the cross, the Bible says that darkness fell on the earth. And scientists have told us, using their calculation, that it was actually an eclipse that happened. So that darkness marked evening. When the eclipse cleared and it became day again, it marked day. So while he was still on the cross, he was dead for one evening, the eclipsed evening, and the day that marked the first day. Then they buried him. So the second night was now the Friday night proper. And Saturday morning is now the second day complete. So the eclipse night, and when the eclipse cleared, marked the day. The Friday night and Saturday morning marked the second day. Then the Saturday night <laughs> and the Sunday morning marked the third day. I hope that I solved the enigma because people have said, no, oh, that he didn't die on Friday, that it was on Thursday. No, the Bible was clear when he died. The Bible was very, very clear that he died a day before Sabbath. And Sabbath is Saturday. So that means Jesus died on Friday. So when then did the three days come in? I believe I've just explained that to you. Well, <laughs> it wasn't my intention to do that, but as I was preaching, I just felt that I needed to clear that enigma. All right. So, the sun was darkened and the veil of the, of the temple was turned into two. The Bible says from top to bottom. And Jesus had cried out with a loud voice. And he said, Father, into your hands. Hallelujah. I commit my spirit. Having said that, the Bible says that he breathed his last and died so it is clear that jesus died now look at the next scripture i want to show you in romans chapter 10 verse 7 the bible says something in romans chapter 10 verse 7 saying who will ascend into the abyss remember i told you some of the names um that hell was also used uh was used for hell rather interchangeably one is abyss 
in the New King James Version. Say, who descended into the abyss? He said, that is to bring Jesus from the dead. This is Paul asking a question when he was talking about faith and salvation. So that means Jesus went to the abyss. Immediately he died on the cross. Ephesians 4 was so clear on that. Verse 8 to 9 says, Therefore he says, when he ascended on high, talking about his ascension into heaven, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. And I said, now this, he descended, he ascended. What does he mean? But that he also first, first descended. So before Jesus ascended to heaven, he first descended. Hallelujah. So there was a, he, he descended. After he died on the cross, he descended. And you might ask yourself, this descent, descent, what does that mean? Where did he climb down to? Did he climb into a well? <laughs> you know? Oh, uh, yes. And that will bring me to the next thing I want to show you. Where is hell? Where is hell? Sorry if I'm rushing a bit because I want to give this teaching in record time. I have a lot of things to share with you. So you permit me. That's why I say get your pen, get your notepad, write as much as you can, write the scriptures as much as you can. Then go subscribe to our podcast. Go to Activate Church www.activatechurch.co.uk forward slash podcast. Subscribe to our podcast. Our podcast is on all podcast platforms. So whichever platform you use to listen to your podcast, you're going to find us. Just search for Activate Word. The best way to do that, like I said, is go to our website. When you go to the podcast platform, they will direct you to your favorite podcast platform and you will subscribe there that's if it is difficult to search for our podcast on your platform so why am i saying that because you need to listen to this message again believe me you need to hear everything i said today again so it to marinate in your soul and sink down in your soul and i would love you to ask questions please if you are watching online ask questions if you are watching on zoom Go to the chat, ask questions, and I would um, answer your questions on Tuesday because you might not have time today to take all your questions. So any question you have, confusions about what I'm going to teach, go on your chat, leave those questions. Go online if you're watching on our platform or you're watching on YouTube. Go to the comment section, leave your questions. Tune in on Tuesday, Bible Surfing, and by the help of the Holy Spirit, we will answer your questions for you. So, where is hell. Where is hell? From the scriptures I've, I've already read to you, he talks about descending. A descent, meaning going down. That means hell is located somewhere under our feet. I really crack this joke whenever I'm teaching on this subject. I tell the church, do you know you are standing on hell? And they be like, standing on hell? What do you mean I'm just standing on the ground? I say, yes, you're standing on hell. Hell is literally under your feet. You know, <laughs> so, and I'm going to show you some scriptures to prove that. Now, first scripture I'm going to show you is about Jonah. You know, Jonah was swallowed by the fish. Of course, everybody knows about Jonah, the whale that swallowed Jonah. And Jonah prayed a prayer, prayed a prayer when he was in the belly of the fish. There's something he said I want to point your attention to. Now, the Bible says in Jonah chapter 2 from verse 1, and verse 2. The Bible says that Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish and said, see what he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. <laughs> and he answered me from where? Can you say that together with me? Out of the belly of Sheol. Remember I told you some of the other names used in place of hell one of those names is Sheol. Akkad, the Bible says, he prayed from the belly of the fish, but God answered him out of the belly of Sheol. Think about this. If a fish swallowed you and you were there for three days and three nights without oxygen, the only gas that might be in a, in a, 
in a belly of a mammal will be poisonous gases, ammonia, nitrate, or whatever gas. I'm not a scientist, but you know what I mean. There is no oxygen that a human being needs to leave, breathe in, in the belly of the fish. So that means that Jonah died. If Jonah did not die, Jesus would not have used him as a comparative analysis or as a comparison to what to what happened to him on the cross and uh, subsequently so he died you can't be three days in the belly of the fish and be alive he died and he went to shore he went to hell that was where he cried out and god answered him and heard his voice now see what jesus said when he was talking about that Jesus now said in matthew chapter 12 verse 40 this is jesus speaking literally say for as jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart heart of the earth so jesus have already told us from that scripture the location of hell so where is hell Hell is what we call in in geography the Earth's core. So you see this Earth's core? That is where hell is. Scientists have told us that the core of the Earth is molten magma. That is why when you have volcano or any any, uh, volcanic eruption, I think last, was it two weeks ago, my last one was was telling me that there was a volcanic eruption in somewhere in Iceland and he was telling me the other volcanic eruptions all over the world. I was like, hmm, I, 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 I didn't even know, about, I didn't even hear about that. You know, when you watch on your TV or movies or, you know, any documentary and you see where there was a volcanic eruption, that mountain magma that comes out from that mountain is fire, but liquid fire liquid fire time will fail me to go deep into the study of location of hell maybe some other time i'll sit down on it and i'll show you the bible jesus talks a whole lot about hell a whole lot he talked about the worms there that don't die he talked about how the fire burns and it is never put out he said a lot of things about it so i also tell people that anytime you hear of a volcanic eruption it is hell expanding itself because the bible made it clear in isaiah that hell is constantly expanding hell is in constant expansion that's as believers we need to take preaching the gospel of our lord jesus christ very serious because every second people are dying and going to hell and to accommodate the millions dying every day the the construction company of hell needs to create room for them so whenever there's a volcanic eruption it is hell expanding itself you know when i teach or the location of hell i teach and teach on this i i usually teach them how drilling science works and that's exactly what happens they drill the core of the earth and pump it out they drill the walls of the earth to create space and pump it out using some of the fire to expand hell hallelujah so another scripture that talks to us about the location of hell is the story jesus told in luke chapter 16 and it's the story of the rich man and lazarus i remember that story about the rich man the beggar who was at the gate of the about the a beggar called lazarus which was at the gate of the rich man And the rich man never looked at him for a second. Never extended benevolence to him. And the Bible says something beautiful in verse 22. That when Lazarus died, angels came and carried him to Abraham's bosom. And the Bible says, and the rich man died. (laughs) No angel, no nothing. He just died. I was buried. Chicken, And the Bible says, I'm being in torment in Hages. He died and went to Hages. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off. 
People have said, oh, Abraham's bosom is in heaven. Well, we're going to find out from this scripture where truly Abraham's bosom was at this time when Jesus told this story. He looked and he could see Abraham because if Abraham was in heaven, if Abraham's bosom was in heaven and hell we've proven so far is in the earth's core, right? How come from the middle of the earth, he could see through earth, see through space, then see heaven. <laughs> it's not possible. But let's, let's carry on reading. The Bible says that he cried and said to Father Abraham, Have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to go dip his hand, his finger, in water and cool my tongue. Why? For where I am, I am tormented in this flame. So that means this Hages has flames and there is torment in this place. But Abraham said, listen to what Abraham said. Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And he now said, and besides all this, listen, besides all this, even if I want to show you benevolence and send Lazarus to come cool your tongue. Even if I want to do that, listen to what he said. He said, between us, between us, where you are and where we are, there is a great gulf. I think King James says chasm, meaning a big depression separating the two places. He said, so that those who want to pass from here, to you cannot, nor can those there pass to us. This tells you something, that they were on the same plane. So it is not hell in the earth and heaven far above, no. Where these two locations are, are in the same plane, plane. The difference is that there is a big depression, a big gulf, like massive erosion between them separating the two locations but these two locations are all in the earth's core somebody will say pastor so abraham's bosom is in the earth is in hell yes that's why it's called hell and hages it used to be two compartments before and i explained that as we go on that's why you need to listen and get your notepad and your pen it used to be two compartments before jesus died and resurrected no soul could go to heaven Apart from a few, in fact, the Bible only mentioned two that did, Enoch and Elijah. Apart from both of them, every righteous man, including Abraham, David, name all of them from the Bible, when they died, they descended. So hold that thought. I'm going to come back to that, but let me show you another place, another story in the Bible that confirms that hell is in the earth's core. And it's the story of Korah. Korah was a rebel. He was the number one um, opposition leader to Moses when they were in the wilderness. And at a point, they got so tired that Korah led a rebellion and demanded from Moses that they go back to, e to Egypt, that they are tired of this wilderness. Remember, they rigmarole in the wilderness for 40 years. And Moses needed to take control. So he needed to show who was boss. He now said to him that if truly God is with him, now he was speaking to Korah and he was pronouncing judgment. He said, if God is with me, Korah, let the earth, he said, if God is with me, number one, you will not die a normal death. That you will die a kind of death that nobody has died before. And what was the death he described? You see that in Numbers 16 from verse 31. He said, if God is truly for me, Korah and everyone standing with you, he says, let the earth, the earth <laughs> split apart under you guys and you will be swallowed. And the Bible says that it came to pass as he was finishing, finishing speaking, issuing the instruction to the earth. The Bible says the earth, the ground split apart under them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up <laughs> with their household, all the men, with Korah, with all their goods. So they and all those 
that we are with them. Listen to this. I underlined it. Went down a life into the pit. Another word for hell, like I showed you at the beginning, is pit. Enoch, eh, eh, Enoch rather, and um, Elijah went to heaven while they were still alive. Korah and all the rebels with him went to hell, descended to hell while they were still alive. <laughs> and the Bible says, and they perished from among the assembly. So where is hell? Hell is the earth's core. The earth's core. One more example, because the Bible says, based on two or three witnesses, is a doctrine established. And that is Samuel. You know, Prophet Samuel. So, but Prophet Samuel prophesied to Saul, or rather told Saul, that he has been rejected by God because of his disobedience to God's word. And he died. Now he needed to go for a battle with the Philistines. And he wasn't sure the outcome of the battle. So what did he do? He went to, to a witch called Endor. And that was totally against God's commandment because God had banished every witch from the land. You remember that popular scripture, suffer not the witch to live. But he went in disguise to go and inquire from the witch of Endor because his seer had died. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 28 from verse 13 that and the king, when she, he got to, 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 uh, to the witch, told her, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Yes, I know about the law that witches are not supposed to exist, but don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Tell me what you see. And the woman said to Saul, I see a spirit ascending where? Out. Out. Ascending out of what? The earth. Remember what I told you at the beginning? Before Jesus died and resurrected, every righteous person, when they die, they descend. Nobody could go to heaven because the only way to heaven, Jesus made it clear, was through him, through him, Jesus. That is believing in him. That's why I said he's the door. He's the gates. That no one can come to the Father except by him. Hallelujah. So every righteous man descended. That was why the places, the place rather they went to in hell, which some people want to call paradise or or hey, whatever they want to call it, you know. But the Bible called it Abraham's bosom. At that place, the righteous people were not tormented. Their own portion of that place at Escor is different from the portion of the wicked ones. The wicked ones, there was fire and there was suffering. There was torment. But Abraham's bosom was okay. Well, there, was, there was bliss there. They had water. They were enjoying themselves, waiting, waiting on Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So that was where Samuel was. So when the witch invoked his spirit, he came up from the from the from the earth. So and the spirit ascended from out from the earth. Why am I showing you this to show you where that location is? He came up. The spirit did not come from above down. He the spirit came from below up. And the next verse. And the Bible says, and she said, an old man is coming up. It's coming up. So that means where they are is under the earth. Now I've shown you, I've shown you um, evidences from the scriptures. But what I've also discovered, which is a beautiful thing, to show you the authenticity of God's word, is that scientists are also found out that this is true. And this is from BBC Future. It's from BBC Future to tell you that it's authentic. The scientific evidence of the earth. In, the, in this, in this um, you can search for it online. In this publication, these scientists, we are drilling a hole in, um, in Siberia, I think, somewhere in Russia. You know, and that, that that hole was called a Kola Super Deep Bore Hole. 
you know, they are research, they are carrying out some sort of research, you know. And they dug this hole. See, it took them 20 years to drill. Now, why am I talking about this? You can go and read it up. I don't have time to go deep into it. It's online. Why am I talking about this? See, they had dug down, deep down, 12.2 kilometers into the ground. This is where that, this is the location, this is the picture of where this happened. You know, when, you know, a Dutch artist named Lotte Given lowered her mic, protected by a thermal shield because they said the 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 heat when they measured it was about twenty thousand degrees fahrenheit it is that hot so she lowered a specialized mic into the hole to listen they said they could pick up rumbling sound say very rumbling sound say it made her scared you know it was all that's it and they described it as, you know, sounds of hell. But the scientists wanted to call it, you know, that is the planet breathing. But there was a, by the time they finished this, they stopped. Because when they heard, well, because of the things they heard, they stopped. And they sealed that hole. Sealed it up completely. <laughs> Never to be opened. You know. And of course... People have debunked, debunked what they heard, that they did not hear any sounds from hell, that is a lie. And quite frankly, if there was no debunking of that story, I personally would not have believed it. And this is the, when you go to Wikipedia, it's a well to hell hoax, meaning it's a hoax that is not true, blah, 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 that they are lies, they're not true. Honestly, if it was not debunked, I will not believe it because the enemy will not want scientists to prove that hell exists. Hell is real. Hell is real. Hell is real. Jesus went to hell and it was prophesied. David, like I told you on Friday, is not just a king, he's also a prophet. And in Psalm 16, he talked about it. What did he say in Psalm 16? He said, For you will not leave my soul in shore. Nor will you allow your Holy One. Who is the Holy One? He's talking about Jesus Christ. See corruption. Corruption means decay and death. And never to rise again. Yes, he died, but he did not decay. You know. And when you read that in NLT, the word shore was replaced with among the dead. Say you will not allow your Holy One to rot. He did not decay. It was prophesied. Peter also picked up this prophecy in Acts when he was preaching on that um, day of Pentecost. He talked about it in Acts chapter 2, from verse 25. He said, for David said this concerning Christ, you know, he said, I foresaw our Lord <laughs> always before my face, for he is at the, my right hand that I may not be shaken. He said, therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope for you will not leave my soul in hages, nor will you allow your Holy One to seek corruption. What is he talking about? He talked about two things. Number one, David said, you will not allow me to stay in hages. Then, the Jesus Christ will not decay. So what was David talking about? You don't allow me to stay in hages. Hold that thought. I'm going to come to it. I don't want to drop the going. Hallelujah. So why, why was it necessary for Jesus to go to hell? Number one, the Bible says, For everyone have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that the wages of that sin is death. Now, because Jesus is God, he was sinless. He needed, he needed, listen, he needed for him to go to hell. He needed. He needed, <laughs> let me say this, if Jesus did not take upon himself the sin nature, if he did not take upon himself the sin nature, he would not have gone to hell. I'll say that again. If Jesus did not take upon himself the sin nature, he would not have gone to hell because he was sinless. And 
he was not born of a man. Listen carefully. Everyone born of a man was born into sin. If Jesus was born of a man, then his sacrifice on the cross will not work. Why? It was a sinless lamb that needed to be sacrificed in place of the people. So for Jesus to fulfill the criteria of being a sinless lamb, he needed to come sin sinless. And the only way to do that was to be sure that he was born of a woman so he can acquire flesh, but not of a man. Why? Ancestral curses is passed from the man. It is in the seed of man. That's why when Eve ate the fruit, man did not fall until Adam ate the fruit. If Adam had offered a penitence or sacrifice for Eve when she ate the fruit without himself eating it, man would not have fallen. That's what the Bible says, see, that Eve was deceived, but Adam was in disobedience. It is the disobedience to God's word that made man fall. So everything from his loins was born in sin. That is why if you read your Bible very well, never will you find anywhere in the Bible where Jesus was where, where Joseph was called the father of Jesus. When you read Matthew chapter 1 verse 18, it was clear who the mother of Jesus was and who his father was. The Bible says his mother was Mary, but his father was the Holy Spirit, not Joseph. So whenever Jesus talked about his father, he never referred to Joseph as his father. His father was the Almighty God. Because Joseph did not contribute his sperm to the birth of Jesus. If he had, Jesus would have been would have been would have been born in with the sin nature. I hope you're understanding. Would have born with the sin nature. And if he was born with the sin nature, his sacrifice on the cross would not have been potent. While the lamb for sacrifice needed to be without blemish. But for him to go to hell, because he needed to go to hell, for many reasons, that one I'm, I'm showing you, he needed to be made sin. He needed to take up that nature of sin. And he took the nature of sin on the cross. The exact moment he took it, he said something with his mouth. And what did he say? The exact moment he took that sin nature, he said with his mouth, Eli, Eli, Labasabatani, which means, My father, my father, why have you forsaken me? All through his journey on earth, the father never forsook him. But immediately he took up sin, the nature of sin, God turned his back on him. Why? It is fulfillment of scripture that talks about the nature of God. What is the nature of God? The Bible says that God is too holy, too holy to behold iniquity. So immediately he was made sin, God turned his back on him. <laughs> and he needed to be made sin. Because the Bible showed us, those scripts showed us in Hebrews, that he needed to be made sin and he took the punishment for sin and sacrificed for sin with his life. So, man, Adam, died when he ate the fruit because God was explicit in his instruction in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. So, see, see that tree of knowledge of good and evil? Immediately you eat it, you will surely die. Not talking about death physically as you well know because he was still alive physically but he was disconnected from God his spirit died his spirit died 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1 told us that Jesus was made sin on the cross the Bible says for he 
made him sin. Who is he? The father made him. Who is him? Jesus Christ. So let's replace he and him with the two um, um, subjects. For God the Father made Jesus Christ sin. Who knew no sin for us? It was when he was made sin that God turned his back on him and he shouted from the cross, My Father! My Father! Why have thou forsaken me? Why did he do that? So, hallelujah, <laughs> you and I might become the righteousness, hallelujah, of God in him. Glory be to God. I want you to shout from where you are. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Say, I am justified <laughs> of the Lord. Say, nothing, nothing, Satan, the enemy has nothing, absolutely nothing on me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory be to God. So he took the sin nature. That was why he went to hell. He needed to. Okay, the last scripture on that is Hebrews 9 verse 26. I've already talked about that. He said, he, was, he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So let's hurry along. Some of the reason why he went to hell, which is why I dispute with that addendum that that church added to the Apostles' Creed about hell. That hell, a place for the dead, not a place for punishment. He went to hell and was punished for our sins because the Bible talked about it. Peter talked about it. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18. The Bible says, For Christ also suffered once for sins. He suffered. So he went to hell and he suffered. Hebrews 9, verse 18 also talked about it. That he was offered once to do what? Bear the sins of many. So he suffered. Another reason why he went to hell is to pay the price, the penalty for our sin. And Romans 6 verse 23 talks about that. I said, for the wages, for the wages of sin is death. So he needed to die. But he could not die if he was not made sin. Hallelujah. <laughs> glory be to God. <laughs> he said, but the gift of God, glory be to God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I want you to shout where you are. Say, I have the life of God in me. <laughs> glory be to God. You have the life of God in you. The God kind of life is right in you. And that scripture of that is Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Say, but we see Jesus, glory, who was made a little lower than angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might, glory, pay the penalty of sin, which is death for everyone. I want you to scream out loud, say, Jesus died. He paid the price for me so that today i will be free from the clutches of spiritual death amen and amen and i like this one <laughs> why did jesus go to hell he went to hell to defeat satan to destroy satan to disarm satan glory be to god <laughs> satan was utterly annihilated the bible tells us in hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 he said, in as much as the children have partaken of flesh and bones. He said, he himself likewise shared in the same. That through his death, he might do what? Destroy him that had the power of death. And in case you don't know who had the power of death. He said, hey, that is the devil. <laughs> That's why he took the keys of hell and ages from him. You know, Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 said, he disarmed principalities when he was in hell and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in him. We're like, oh, who were the people spectating? He made a public spectacle, meaning people were spectating when Jesus defeated, disarmed, and destroyed Satan. Who were the people that were the spectators? The, it was the people, the righteous saints, at the bosom of Abraham. Remember, they were in the same plane. So when Jesus was in the other side of hell, Satan's side, and defeated the, him and all his cohorts, devils, principalities, and powers, 
There will be a crowd on the other side cheering him on. Abraham, David, Joshua, Moses, everybody, they were sharing him on. <laughs> Satan's defeat was a public defeat. It was not secret. <laughs> glory, glory. See why we need to celebrate Easter. It is a season. It is a feast of victory. Jesus had his victory parade on Easter Sunday. Glory. And they were cheering him on, cheering him on as he did that. That is why when he appeared to Apostle Paul, forgive me, Apostle John, at the island of Patmos, at the beginning of Revelation, he told him something in verse 18. He says, see, I am he that lives. I was dead, <laughs> but he said, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I said, hey, hey, John, he dangled the keys. He said, I have the keys of Hages. That is Abraham's bosom. And death, that is hell. <laughs> he dangled it for him to show him that he, that he defeated, hell. he conquered, like he said he will, <laughs> and he put Satan in his place, <laughs> and he arose victorious. <laughs> Glory be to God. Another reason why he went to hell was to preach to the souls in hell. Oh. My time is up. My time is up. Was to preach the souls in hell. <laughs> the Bible tells us that in First Peter chapter three verse nineteen said, "By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. He preached to Abraham. He preached to all those saints. Why? God will not be just if he didn't give them the opportunity to hear the gospel. That's number one. Number two." They will not have been taken to heaven without them believing in Jesus Christ. Remember, I told you at the beginning that Jesus is the gate. Jesus is the door. That anyone that comes through him will go to the Father. So if he did not preach to them, he would have given them the opportunity to believe in him, which now qualifies them to be taken to heaven. Because he did that. He took them to heaven and hell had now expanded into uh, Abraham's bosom. So there's nothing like Abraham's bosom now. So he preached to them and he got them saved. And he himself said it before he died in John chapter 5 verse 25. What did he say? He said, most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead, the dead will do what? Hear the voice of the Son of God. So he even prophesied it. He talked about it before dying. That he was going to go to hell, the place of the dead, and preach to them. And I said, and those who hear will leave. What does that mean? They will have eternal life so they can be taken to heaven. The next point is, was to lead these people he preached to, the righteous to heaven. And he did that. The Bible says in Matthew 27. I'm sorry, I'm, ru I'm, ru I'm rushing. <laughs> Forgive me. I know I'm rushing. I just want to keep to time. And there's a lot of things to say. He said that in Matthew 27. He said, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom into two. The earthquake, the rock split, and the graves. And the graves were open. Not just his grave. But many other graves that resurrection morning open. Whose graves? Graves of the righteous saints that heard him preach, believed in him, and they became converted. The Bible says they all came out of the graves after his resurrection. And they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So, they were witnesses to the fact that saints of old came back to life. I'm sure some people went on, the, on that day, saw David. Wow, they were like, Were you David? They're the giant killer. He said, Yes. Some people were like, Abraham, oh, Moses, they saw all the saints of old. Oh my God. I Okay, I don't wish, but I can imagine how that resurrection morning was. In Jerusalem, mine would have been mind blowing. I've been so eventful. The, the, the inhabitants of Jerusalem would not have forgotten that day. 
That's why the priests and the high priests and the religious leaders, they try so hard to quell the news. They try so hard to do that. But no, 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 no. You cannot quell good news. Hallelujah. And when that early Sunday morning, uh, Mary went to the, to, the, to the tomb to do, you know, as the ought to in preparation of the dead, put some more ointment to the embalmment and all that. But when she got there, she found that the grave was open, that the tomb was open. And he said, she said, looking for, for Jesus. So a man that she thought, she thought was the gardener. I was asking him, who is my Lord? Who is my Lord? And finally, you know, she discovered it was Jesus. And Jesus said something profound, profound to her. What did Jesus say? He said, see, don't touch me because she wanted to rush and hug him. See, don't touch me. Don't touch me. I'm here to ascend to God. My father, your father, my God, your God. Say, but go, go and tell the disciples that I've risen, that I'm going to come and see them. Where was he ascending to? He was leading the righteous. These people that believed in him, that resurrected with him, he was taking them to heaven. Jesus ascended twice. The same way, He's going to come twice. He came the first time when he was born and he's going to come again. He ascended two times. This first ascension where he took his blood to go and offer the mercy seat, where he took the righteous saints to heaven. This ascension was described in, in Psalm 24. When you read it, you will get gain insight into this ascension. And he came back and spent 40 days with his disciples, then ascended again, ascended again, you know, in Acts chapter 1. When you read that place I showed you in Ephesians chapter 4, he said, he ascended, he led captivity captive to heaven. That was talking about the first ascension because when he ascended in art, he ascended alone. He didn't ascend with anybody. So leading the captivity captive, talking about the prisoners in, in, uh, in, in, in Hages, the prisoners in Abraham's bosom that he preached to, the righteous saints, he led them to heaven first. So this is ascension being described here. So why is resurrection very important? Why is resurrection very important? Why? Number one, resurrection is so important because we know that Jesus is alive today. He's alive. He's alive. The Bible tells us that in Ephesians 1 verse 20, he seated at the right hand of God. In John 14 verse 3, he told them before he even died that I'm going to prepare a place for you after my death. You know, resurrection declares that Jesus is God. Hallelujah. It declares the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Glory be to God. See, resurrection, why resurrection? It is the power of the gospel. It is the power of the gospel. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. He said to the Jews first, then to the Greek. Without resurrection, if Jesus did not resurrect, there will be no church. Christianity and the church, which is the body of Christ, is, is existing because our Savior resurrected. Ha! Hallelujah. Resurrection is so important because it lets us know that we, the members of his body, we are dead to sin. And the Bible tells us that in, in Romans chapter 6. He says, see, for he who has died has been freed from sin. He said, likewise you also do what? Reckon yourself. Meaning, see yourself. Start seeing yourself. Start perceiving yourself as such. As being dead indeed to sin. Why? Because we died with him and we resurrected with him. Glory be to God. 
and we'll be made alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory, glory, glory. He said, for sin shall no longer have dominion over me. I want you to declare that. Say, sin shall no longer have dominion over me. Glory be to God. That is how you put your flesh under subjection. You speak to your flesh. Say, flesh, I am resurrected with Christ. Sin, sin in this flesh, fleshly lost, you can no longer have dominion over me. Next is the newness of life because Jesus resurrected and we resurrected with him. We resurrected into newness of life. So Paul also speaking in that place in Romans chapter 6. He says, see, that we were buried in baptism into there just as Christ was, that the Father, even so, he says, see, we should also work in this newness of life. He said, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also should be in the likeness of his resurrection. Glory, glory, glory be to God. <laughs> and, you know, Jesus speaking to the woman, Mary, um, um, Lazarus' sister. He said, see, I am the resurrection and the life. Is anyone that believes in me, though he may die physically, but will live. Hallelujah. And I love this one. I love this one as we, we are ending now. <laughs> the same power <laughs> that brought Jesus back to life is in you. I want you to say that. Say the same power that resurrected Jesus, that brought Jesus back to life is in me. And Romans tells us that. He said, hey, if that spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in your mortal body, hey, see that same spirit will quicken it, will give life to it. <laughs> that spirit dwells in you. Declare it, put your hands on your head. Say, The spirit of God <laughs> is in me. <laughs> I command my body right now. <laughs> to be alive. I command sickness and diseases to leave this body in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the next is that because Jesus resurrected, we will also resurrect after we are dead. That is the blessed hope. That one day, at the sound of the last trump, <laughs> that we will resurrect the Bible says that the dead in Christ will rise first. Then the ones that are living will be caught up together with him. Because Jesus resurrected, we will be resurrected and a new body will be given us. Another thing about resurrection, as we close, is that we know because he resurrected, he's going to come back for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, the angels... When Jesus ascended in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, told the disciples, you see, this same Jesus Christ of Nazareth <laughs> that you've seen taken off from among you, in the same manner, he's going to come back. He's going to come back. <laughs> he's going to come back. He's coming back, folks. I don't know about you. I am expecting his coming. I'm excited about his coming. How many of you are expecting the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? <laughs> he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. <laughs> Let's just worship the Lamb with this song. <laughs> Oh, makata karege lego bo shata yakane sata yaka ba 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 ba. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 